Good afternoon. I want to uh, welcome you to a, a plenary session. It's our first attempt to have a presidential plenary. My name is Rex Fuller, I'm the president here at Western Oregon University. So what's very uh, cool about today's uh, plenary is it's around uh, the eclipse, which is coming up. And so for me, it really blends three of our pillars out of our planning process together. Student success, which I've talked about, academic excellence, but also community engagement, because it's an opportunity for the university to host guests from all over the country. Uh, we have literally filled out all of our residence halls. We're down to about 70 beds that haven't been rented. Otherwise, the campus will be really bustling. Uh, so as we look to August 19th and 20th, and then the eclipse on the 21st. We're going to have hundreds and hundreds of people here on campus trying to enjoy uh, that opportunity uh, once in a lifetime in some cases. Uh, but as you know, we are really ground zero uh, for the eclipse path, which makes it all the more important for us to host something like this as part of our academic showcase in advance of what we'll be doing this summer. And I hope many of you will be here this summer. Uh, it's uh, not quite like the Olympics where you can rent out your house and leave town, but uh, I think we'll have a, a full full slate of guests throughout the region and so we're looking forward to that as well. Uh, but without further ado, this plenary is about uh, the, uh, all the different ideas around the eclipse from humanities to science. Uh, it gives you a sense of what it means in terms of religion, it means in terms of, means in terms of people's beliefs, uh, uh, and it also is a, a chance to understand why does it happen, how does it happen, uh, and the, uh, the mathematics behind some of the trajectories, and also the science behind the, uh, the work itself. Uh, so with that, without further ado, again, welcome. interested in this eclipse specifically for as long as I knew what astronomy was. I have loved the stars for as long as I can remember and I made a promise when I was a little girl that I would road trip to wherever this eclipse has taken place and I would be there and now I'm living right at the heart of it so nice up my child self. <laughs> And so uh, this poem was really inspired by that desire to see this eclipse, not only for this rare occurrence, because it really is a once in a lifetime opportunity, but when you see this eclipse, it's, it's a moment of connection, not just for everyone that you're watching it with, but in that moment, you're watching something that people have been watching and wondering about for thousands and thousands of years, for as long as we've been people, which is spectacular, if I do say so myself. So I'm really excited to share this with you all today. It's called Total Solar Eclipse. They are moon children, not made of collapsing dust and star heart iron, but of ancient earth and crude metal. Their roots are not trapped in one place, but follow the path of that blackened eye that was predicted a thousand years ago by their lost ancestors. In the past, they could not look upon its brilliance themselves, so they listened to the sun, who lent its force to our moon for one minute and 54 seconds alone, and built new eyes to watch it. On the morning of, they stand still, staring expectantly at the sky, even though the exact time has been known to a hundredth of a breath, clutching dark glasses and shaking, it is the closest they will ever get to home. The light mist sharply fades, and these eclipse chasers fall silent at last, forgetting even their cameras as shadow follows the horizon and night and day collide. They are moon children, and it is their time at last. Thank you very much. I'm so excited to be presenting the keynote presentation of the first ever presidential plenary at Academic Excellence Showcase. No pressure, right? I am here today to share with you some information about the great American eclipse we will experience here in Oregon on August 21st of this year. Now, I am a professor in the Earth Science Department here, and that means I like to share science as a good story but my focus is in GIS, which means I spend a lot of time thinking about, talking about, making, and teaching about maps. So we are going to start this eclipse story with some maps. First, let's find ourselves. Here is a map that shows Western Oregon University and the towns of Monmouth and Independence. And just south of town, about two and a half miles south of us here on campus, is an orange line. 
That line marks the center of the path the eclipse will take this summer. And everywhere you see in this picture is in exactly the right place to see this eclipse. Everywhere in this picture will experience about two minutes of darkness around 10:19 a.m. the morning of August 21st. I have never personally experienced an eclipse like this before, but I am told that when the eclipse happens, it will be like twilight just before those two minutes of darkness. Animals may act like it is nighttime. The temperature will drop noticeably, and the stars will come out and be visible, even though it is still mid-morning. It should be quite a show. So let's zoom out a bit and see who else in Oregon will get to see this show. This map shows the path of the eclipse, which will start near Depot Bay, Oregon on our coast, and will travel quickly from west to east before leaving the state near Ontario, Oregon. You may notice that the path on this map does not cover the entire state. In fact, the path is only about 70 miles wide, and areas outside of that shadowed band cutting across the state will not experience the total darkness that I just described. The eclipse will happen differently in Portland, Roseburg, Bend, anywhere outside of that shadowed path. If we zoom out still further, we can see why this eclipse is being called the Great American Eclipse. The path for this particular eclipse starts on our west coast and ends on our east coast, cutting across the United States from sea to shining sea. Again, anywhere along this shadowed path will experience the darkness I described earlier, and everywhere outside of this path will see something different. While everyone in the continental US will see something strange happening with our sun on August 21st, only those along that narrow path get to experience total darkness during the day. Hopefully, it's starting to seem pretty special that we're only 2.7 miles away from the center line of that path. To describe what the rest of the US gets to see that morning, we need to talk about what exactly a solar eclipse is and the different types of solar eclipse. A solar eclipse happens when the shadow of the moon falls onto the Earth. This can only happen when the moon comes between the Earth and the sun. The shadow has two parts, the umbra and the penumbra. The umbra is the darkest part of the shadow, and when it falls on Earth, it covers a very small area. The penumbra covers more area, but it is not completely dark because some of the light from the sun is not blocked in those areas. So a solar eclipse happens when some part of the moon's shadow falls onto Earth. There are three main types of solar eclipse, total, annular, and partial. In a total solar eclipse, the moon and the sun line up perfectly in the sky, with the moon completely blocking the light from the sun for a brief period of time, about two minutes for us here in Oregon. This type of eclipse can only be seen if you are in the path of the umbra, the darkest part of the moon's shadow. This is referred to as the path of totality and is that shadowed band we saw on the previous maps. During that time, we experience darkness and we can see the corona of the sun and the stars all around. The corona of the sun is the outermost atmosphere and it is usually too dim to see compared to the full brightness of the main body of the sun. It's always there, we just can't see it until a total solar eclipse. In a partial solar eclipse, the moon never lines up completely perfectly with the sun, so only part of the sun gets covered, and it winds up looking a little bit like Pac-Man. While the light will seem odd and dim if you're in the path of the penumbra, it won't go away completely. That's because in the case of a partial solar eclipse, the light from the sun is still making it into part of that area. And this also means you can't see the corona or the stars. There's still just too much light from the sun. A partial solar eclipse is what most of the US will experience this summer. This picture was taken during a partial eclipse in Texas in 2015. So if you're in Portland this summer, this is the type of eclipse you can expect to see. The best show will be here. To explain the third type of eclipse, an annular solar eclipse, we need to look at more than just the shadow. We need to look at the mechanics of why eclipses happen in the first place. If we look at how our Earth, our moon and the sun are related to each other in space, then we can draw a picture like this one. Here, the earth and the sun, very much not to scale, 
are on a flat surface or a plane. As the earth rotates around the sun, it stays on that plane. The moon is tilted about five degrees off that sun-earth plane. This means that it spends about half of its time above the plane and about half of its time below the plane. A solar eclipse can only happen when the moon crosses this plane, and only if the moon crosses the plane during a new moon. It's during a new moon that the moon is in between the earth and the sun, which allows the moon's shadow to fall onto the earth. This typically happens about twice a year. The rest of the time, we don't have an eclipse because the shadow is either just above or just below the earth. The tilt of the moon's orbit helps explain why we don't see a solar eclipse every month, but we still haven't explained annular eclipses. It turns out the moon does not always stay a constant distance from Earth. As it orbits, it sometimes is a little bit closer and sometimes a little bit further away. It wobbles in its orbit, which is why I titled this talk Bombaleo. Bombaleo is Spanish for wobble and the name of a rather catchy song we heard the beginning of earlier here. The song is about two people who wobble into each other's lives and back out again. Just like the couple in the song, it is the wobble of the moon's orbit, both above and below the ecliptic plane, and further and closer to Earth, that gives us the three types of solar eclipse. So if an eclipse happens, when the moon is further away from Earth, then it no longer actually appears large enough in our sky to completely block all of the sun. When this happens, a small ring of the sun is still visible all the way around the moon. This is an annular solar eclipse. Now that we know about the three types of solar eclipse, it might be a good time to talk about the difference between a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse. In a solar eclipse, the shadow of the moon falls on the Earth. In a lunar eclipse, the shadow of the Earth falls on the moon. This means that lunar eclipses always happen during the full moon, because that is when the moon is opposite of the Earth from the sun. The Earth's shadow has an umbra and a penumbra, just like the moon's, but there's something different about Earth's umbra. Do you see the red wiggly lines? Even though the umbra is the darkest part of the shadow, in the case of the Earth's umbra, not all of the light from the sun is blocked. Our atmosphere scatters all but the longest wavelengths of light. That is to say, all but the red light. So while most of the light is blocked, a small amount of red light still makes it through to shine on the moon. This is why during a lunar eclipse, the moon appears dim and red as the shadow of the Earth falls upon it. The shadow of the Earth allows only red light to pass through the atmosphere and onto the moon. This picture was taken during a total lunar eclipse in Egypt. And the photographer set up the camera to take regular pictures as the moon progressed through the sky and the shadow fell onto and came off of the moon. Now we've heard a few times already that total solar eclipses are once in a lifetime events. I've said as much in the abstract for this talk, but I just told you a few minutes ago that solar eclipses can happen about twice a year. How can both be true? Well, even though eclipses happen about twice a year, the path of each eclipse is quite different nearly every time. It usually takes a long time before another total eclipse will cross over the same part of the Earth again. So even though eclipses happen roughly twice a year, for any given spot on Earth, they typically happen once in a lifetime, or even less often. The last eclipse in Oregon was nearly 40 years ago, in 1979, which is admittedly less than the current average human lifetime. The path of totality for that eclipse was slightly north of here and at a different angle, meaning that in 1979, both Monmouth and Portland, Oregon experienced a total solar eclipse. In 1918, there was a different path still. This path missed Monmouth and Portland, so we'd have seen a partial solar eclipse, but this path did go through Baker City, Oregon. A painter named Howard Russell Butler went to Baker City, Oregon to witness the eclipse and painted this picture of the corona after that event. If we take all of the paths of solar eclipses in North America from 2001 to 2050, so looking at a 50 year time window, and put them all on the same map, we get a map like this one. The yellow paths on this map are total solar eclipses, like we'll see this summer, and the orange paths are annular solar eclipses. That's when the moon's a little bit too far away. 
The next eclipse in Oregon after this summer will be in October of 2023, and that will be an annular eclipse. The next total solar eclipse in Oregon won't be until 2108, though that particular event will only touch a tiny portion of the coast. Portland will not get to experience another total solar eclipse until July of 2169. So while the total solar eclipses in 1979 and 2017 are pretty close together in time, we will definitely have to wait more than 100 years for the next one. So let's talk more about the details of the great American eclipse happening this summer. First, if you're interested in watching the eclipse, you need to think about eye safety. It is not safe to stare directly at the sun at any time the main body of the sun is visible. This means on a regular day like today, or even during the beginning or end of an eclipse when part of the disk is still uncovered. The only way to look safely at the sun is to get some protective eyewear. These wonderful images uh, are from the eclipse in Oregon in 1979. We have some more modern versions available today. The key to eclipse glasses is that they have a very dark filter on them. Uh, we can probably pass these around if people want to see. But they block out the most harmful rays of the sunlight and help protect your eye. The, if you are interested in getting some, we have Wu branded ones that will be available on campus this summer. The cities of Monmouth and Independence have also ordered theirs, or you can check Amazon and you can get the fancier plastic kind. They were 20 bucks when I looked. Price is probably going up. All right. So, eclipse glasses, very important. Um, if you do look online to purchase your own glasses, make sure that they are ISO certified. So you will see that on the glasses themselves or in the description for the glasses. And no, regular sunglasses will not cut it um, because they don't block out the important light. You definitely want to wear the glasses because here's the thing. If you don't and you do stare at the sun, you will damage your eyes, but you won't feel it. The retina, that's the part of your eye near the back, the biologists tell me this is true, okay, uh, will develop scarring from the energy from the sun, but the retina does not have any nerves to feel pain, so you won't feel the damage as it's happening. You can damage or lose your eyesight and never feel a thing. That's why it's especially important to watch children and make sure they wear their glasses as well. I'm sure that'll be no problem at all. I have two, okay. Now that we've got our eyes protected, let's look in detail at what to expect from this eclipse. The eclipse will first start in Depot Bay around 9.04 a.m. local time. As the first part of the shadow, the penumbra, falls onto your location, you'll start to notice a clarity to the sunlight. And if you're wearing your glasses, you can look at the sun and see a small piece appears to be missing. That's the moon starting to cover the disk of the sun. As time passes, you will start to see less and less of the sun, and it will take on a crescent shape. If you are outside, near trees, you may see an interesting effect in the shadows below their branches. The space between the leaves acts like a pinhole camera, reflecting an image of the sun. Normally, we see small circles or dapples in these shadows, but during this part of the eclipse, you can see crescent shapes in the dapples of the shadows, like this picture here. I saw this effect when I was in Arizona and a partial eclipse happened when the light went through a small drain at the top of the apartment building and reflected the image of the sun on the opposite apartment building. It was pretty neat. The extent of the crescent you will see will depend on your location in terms of the path of totality. If you're outside that path, the moon will not line up perfectly with the sun and the crescent shaped sun is the most you will see. But if you are in the path of totality, as we are in Monmouth, then things will get more interesting. Right before the moon completely covers the sun, you'll see a flash that is called the diamond ring effect. This is when a small ring of light from the sun is still visible around the moon, and there's a larger flash of light right on the edge. That flash of light is light from the sun visible through canyons on the edge of the moon. So the picture on the right is showing the canyons on the edge of the moon there. So because it's not a perfect sphere, you get a little extra light. Finally, we reach totality. You can take your glasses off. In fact, you'll have to. It will be too dark to be able to see anything with the glasses on. How long totality lasts depends on where you are along the path. 
For most of Oregon, totality will last right around two minutes, and it will start about an hour after the first contact between the moon and the sun. As I said before, the world around you will be in darkness. It will be noticeably cooler, and you can see the sun's corona and the stars in the sky around. This August, you'll also be able to see the planets Mercury, Venus, Mars, and Jupiter on either side of the sun. As the moon and Earth continue to rotate in their orbits, the moon will begin to uncover the sun, and you will see the same sequence of events, but in reverse. The umbra has passed over us, and now we're back in the penumbra. The opposite side of the sun will start to become uncovered, and you may see something called Bailey's beads. This is a grouping of brighter flashes along the edge of the moon, which is again light shining through the canyons on the moon. When you see these beads, it's time to put your glasses back on. It will take about another hour for the moon to completely pass by and uncover the sun. As it does, everything will return to normal. Animals will come back out, the temperature will rise, the sky will turn blue again, and the euphoria you feel from witnessing the eclipse will be tempered by dealing with the traffic of the expected one million visitors to the state of Oregon, all suddenly wanting to get home. While I expect most people will simply be planning to watch the eclipse, as I am, there are 11 NASA-funded science experiments planned for the event. Six of the experiments are focused on learning about the sun. We currently have satellites that take pictures of the sun and help us monitor space weather. But those tools still have to deal with diffraction of the light that blurs the inner parts of the corona. This makes it very difficult to get reliable information about that part of our sun. It is only during total solar eclipses that scientists can get clear pictures of the corona, making total solar eclipses a very exciting scientific opportunity. In the past, during a total solar eclipse in 1868, a scientist observed a never-before-seen element in our sun's corona. This element was ultimately named after the Greek name for our sun, Helios, which means the helium you use to fill your party balloons was first discovered from observations made during a total solar eclipse. There are also five experiments planned to study the Earth under uncommon conditions. These studies are focused on the rapid changes to light and temperature on the ground and the impacts those changes have on weather, plants, and animals. No matter how you choose to watch the eclipse this summer, it is sure to be a memorable event. Remember your safety glasses, find a comfortable seat somewhere along the path of totality, and enjoy the spectacular show made possible by the wobble of the Earth and the Moon as they move through space. Thank you.